Numbers chapter 9. So this week, in our journey through Numbers, we're going to be looking at God's will and God's moving in the nation of Israel and in our lives, and how the Lord is moving and guiding. And knowing the will of God and keeping it is essential for our Christian life. If you want to live a fulfilled and fruitful life, then you need to be in the will of God and you need to be walking in His will. And sometimes we say, well, how do I know His will? Well, we need to spend time in prayer, spend time in the Word, and you know what? The Lord will show you His will. He will direct you and He will will direct your steps. He will direct your path. And um, sometimes when we ask that question, well, I need to know the will of God, but He's not talking to me, is because we are and I'll just say this nicely because we've all done this, we are actually going, I don't, I don't think that's what I want. I'll just wait until he changes his mind. Uh, we do that a lot. The Lord says, okay, this is how we're going to go. And you go, eh, I think if we go, it's, it's, I'll just wait. Maybe he'll move a little bit. And it's like, oh, okay, no. Um, so we need to be those who are in the word, spending time in prayer and seeking his will because it's so important for our life to know his will. And it's not some deep secret that only is available for very few. It's available for each and every one of us if we just spend time with him seeking and listening to his will as he speaks it into our life. Through the guidance of his Holy Spirit, he will speak to you. Through guidance sometimes of someone else who's praying will confirm something to you. The Lord will say something to you, play something on your heart, and then someone else will say, hey, the Lord was showing me or I felt this, and you kind of go, wow, you know what? That just confirms it, and it's beautiful. And as we're going to see in this section this morning, the children of Israel needed to be watching and listening for the will of God. They need to watch and listen for the will of God. Um, Because if we're not watching and listening for the will of God, as we're going to see for the nation of Israel, they'd get left behind. Let's jump in. uh, Chapter 9, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month, of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, let the children of Israel keep the Passover and its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at appointed time. According to all its rites and ceremonies, you shall keep it. So Moses told the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses So that the children of Israel did. So the first thing in the will of God is if the Lord says, this is what I want you to do, then you should be doing it. If it's a plain instruction, hey, they were to keep the Passover, then what are you supposed to do? Keep the Passover. And you'd think that they're one year out from the first Passover. I think they would be like, I think I'm going to keep the Passover. After what I saw and what I lived through, I'm keeping the Passover. This is important. This is a celebration. And they were coming together. They were to pre- prepare and begin um, to, um, to keep the Passover as they begin their journey because now they're going to begin to move through the wilderness and they had to be reminded, hey, you guys, as you move, as you continue on, you've got to keep the Passover as a reminder. It's so important in our life to have reminders of things of our past. We should not dwell on the past, but we need to be reminded of it. That's a word for our nation. Um, we, need to, we need to remember it, but not dwell on it. Okay? Do you know what I mean by dwell on it? Those who go on and on and extent and talk about how the good old days were when they weren't that good. Those that seem to praise those days. Oh, yeah, you know, I remember when I was a biker and I killed those five people. Yeah, that was, you know, those were the, yeah, but then I got saved. So it's good now. And you kind of go, you're making it sound like it was better back then when you were doing bad stuff. It's like, no. We're not to dwell on it, but we're to remember it, to remind us. Because what happens when we forget? We repeat it. We go, we fall back down. We go back the same way. The Passover was fresh in their minds, and so the Lord says, hey guys, I want you to remind you, you need to keep the Passover. You need to keep it in your mind and in your hearts. And even, he's going to tell them now even how to keep it if they're unclean or if they're out of town. 
these are basic, simple questions. It says in verse 6, it says, Now there, may, there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day. And, and, and those men said to him, We became defiled by a human corpse, but why are we kept from presenting the offering of the, of the Lord at this appointed time among the children of Israel? These guys really wanted to keep the Passover. And they were disappointed. Maybe someone in their family passed away. You know, maybe something happened, a tragedy happened in the camp and they had to go and help out and that person died. And so now they've touched this person and they've become defiled. And they're like, oh man, does this mean, you can see the question, does this mean I have to wait a whole week or a whole year before I can celebrate the Passover again? Do I, do I miss out? And Moses said, verse 8 here, and Moses said to them, stand still that I might hear what the Lord will command concerning you. These are some of the most important words of Moses. Stand still that I may hear what the Lord will command. Moses understood the importance of prayer and waiting upon the Lord. Moses could have said, well, this is what you're going to do. No, he goes, I don't know what you're supposed to do. So you know what? I'm going to check out with the Lord. I've got to go find out what the Lord wants you to do. When someone comes to us with a question and the answer is not readily available... Stand still and bring it before the Lord. It's not a bad thing to say, I don't know the answer. Let me go away and check. Let me seek the Lord on this. Sometimes we get this thing like, well, we have to just answer right away. But we don't have to answer right away. We need to say, okay, I want to seek the Lord. And and Moses knew, knew this and understood this, that he needed to seek the Lord. We need to stand still. We need to take it before the Lord. As we learn to be waiting before the Lord, we find life can be less frustrating and less confusing when we are waiting upon the Lord. When we impulsively jump from thing to thing, we find ourselves constantly in a chaos and a mess because we're doing things on our own power and our own steam. It's my idea. It's my power. It's my thing. Okay, I'm just going to go jump in here and do this. I'm going to jump here and do this. Oh, it didn't work. It didn't work. Okay, now I've got to fix it. How many of you guys have ever had a problem and you tried to fix it and you made it worse? And then you try to fix it again and it seems like the hole keeps getting deeper. And finally you go, okay, Lord, um, so like maybe I should like um, stand still and seek you. And the Lord literally goes, okay, well, it's an easy one. Here we go. Bloop. There you go. Done. You're like, oh. Why didn't I do that six weeks ago or last week or yesterday or five minutes ago? Like, ah. Sometimes we run so far ahead, so far ahead, we, we, we end up in a spiral of confusion and frustration. We have the Holy Spirit who was sent to guide us and comfort us. He comes alongside us and he teaches us all things. And so therefore we need to use him. We need to say, hey, I need help. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to tell these guys. I need some direction. Moses stopped here. He stands still. And sometimes we can so easily, and we all get caught up in it. Somebody asks us a question, and we offer up our opinion or some humanistic suggestion or idea instead of waiting on the Lord for his direction and his guidance. And the best guidance always comes from him. And so we seek him. We dig into the word of God. We look it up. We see and we seek and we say, Holy Spirit, how do we respond to this situation? You know, when this whole COVID thing started, that's exactly what we had to do because it was just like, what do we do? I think we talked about that, I don't remember, maybe it was on, I don't know, the other days, maybe it was Wednesday, about how Thursday, the board, us board guys got together to discuss what to do and how things, and we just had a coffee together, it was a good time. And it was like, ah, well, we're going to just keep going as usual. By Sunday, we were shut down. I think it was that night or maybe the next day the province said shut or everything down. And it was just like Thursday, we were like, ah, this is going to be good. We're going to just, yeah, everything's you know, still safe. We're good. And then a <laughs> day later, it's like, okay, shut her down. We had to wait and say, okay, Lord, what do we do? How do we deal with this? How do we do this? In the, and we just wait and be directed by the Lord. It's important. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if any one of you or your prosperity is unclean because of a corpse, or is far away on a journey, he may, he may still keep 
the Lord's Passover. I think this is interesting because these guys just asked about touching a corpse. And the Lord's, and the, the Lord's answer is, well, this is what you should do if you've been defiled by a corpse and if you're far away or out of town. The Lord gives us more of an answer than we ask because we don't know all the questions. And so sometimes he gives us answers that we didn't even ask. He's like, okay, you didn't ask all the questions, so I'm just going to give you all the answers. Here you go. So if someone's touched a corpse or they've been away on a journey, he may still keep this, the Lord's Passover. On the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. So if you are unclean because you've touched a corpse, you just have to wait one month and then celebrate it the next month. Isn't that beautiful? God just says, okay, fine. Don't get in all panic. You don't have to wait a year. You just have to wait one month. I'm going to take care of you. If you're out of town, when you get back to town, you can celebrate it when you get back that one month later. It's easy. The Lord just lays it out so simply. We, in our mind, we get into this whole tizzy and panic and try to figure things out and scheme and organize. And, well, if we do this and we move this here and I've convinced this person to do this and I can do this, this, this. And God just says, well, how about we just do it next month? Oh, yeah, that would be easy. And then you call everybody, okay, cancel all that. I always think about those uh, episodes and it was a it was a plot mechanism or whatever they used on many sitcoms, but I always think of MASH when they would have those episodes where someone needed something, and so they would trade something with someone else and then trade something with someone else, trade something. And I just remember that one scene where Hawkeye's trying to get a new boot, and he's just like, go, everything's unraveling. All of the deals he made are unraveling, and he's like, you know, I traded this for this, and I traded this for this, and he's like, oh. and he's just spinning, and then he's just, and then at the end of the show, he's walking around with a golf bag on his foot, on his leg as a boot, because he's just like, I give up. I was, like, trying to, I was trying to figure everything out and end up worse than everything. Um, you, you'd have to see it. It's a good, good time. Uh, <laughs> but we sometimes, we, we get so wrapped up in these things, and the Lord just, he lays it out here. He says, hey, on the second month, you can do it. It's easy. But, he continues on. Verse 13, but the man who is clean and is not on a journey and ceases to keep the Passover, that same person shall be cut off from among his people. Because he did not bring the offering of the Lord at its appointed time, that man shall bear his sin. If someone within the camp, they're not unclean, they haven't been away, they just say, Passover, smash over. I don't really want to do it. Then you're to say, you know what? Then you don't belong in the camp. You're going to have to get out. You're going to have to camp outside of the camp. And if you guys realize what that means, if you're outside the camp, what does that mean? You no longer have bread and water. You don't have protection. That would be a scary place to be. This is a massive camp. On the 2.5, 2.3 to 2.5 million people, this is a big camp, and you're being kicked outside of all the resources, everything that's in the camp, and the protection that's in the camp, everything, you're being pushed out. And it's interesting that in the church, God has given us some of the same direction. In Matthew chapter 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Lord uh, inspired Paul to write, Deli deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. If someone is living an out and out sin, in a sinful lifestyle, and they're not willing to repent and turn, then you're to put them outside of the camp. Not that they would be, you know, we use the word excommunicated. And the word excommunicated has gotten a bad rap because some groups have used it where they just shun the person and cut them off completely. You're to put them outside of the camp in hopes that being outside of the camp where they're not protected, where they're not taken care of, they will say, hey, I need to get back in the camp. Because in the church, in the fellowship, there is what? There's love. There's protection. There's the grace of God. There's peace that comes when you're part of a fellowship. All of these things. And when you're ripped, apart, ripped out of that, you're out in the world. 
It says, deliver such a one to Satan. Literally throw them out into the world where they're literally being attacked and they don't have that protection anymore. So that they will turn back. Not that they would be crushed and destroyed, but that they would turn back unto the Lord. It would come back into the camp. And that was the same thing here, is that the person would be um, so uh, ashamed, so crushed that they would come back into the camp eventually. That they would repent and make things right and come back into the camp. And he goes on even more. He says, and if a stranger desires to be part of, a pass, of the Paso, Passover, uh, or if a stranger dwells among you, and would keep the Lord's Passover, he must do so according to the rite of the Passover, and according to its ceremony, you shall have one ordinance for both stranger and the native of the land. So if you've got a stranger living in, this, in the city, they can take part in Passover. And how do they take part in Passover? Well, they don't just do half of the Passover. They got to do the whole thing. They can't just be half-heartedly. They can't just say, well, we're just going to like do the turkey. I, it, it's always funny when you hear atheists and stuff talking about Christmas. And I go, if you don't like it so much, don't do it. Don't steal it. They do everything. They got cards that say, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, but not from God. It's like, where do you think it comes from? Stop stealing stuff and trying to do it. That's just silly. You got to do the whole thing or don't do it at all. And it's interesting because I heard an uh, interview with this uh, comedian who was a, a Jewish, Jewish guy. And he said, you know, the funny thing is, most he had taken a girl on a date. And he'd taken her to a Christmas uh, comedy thing. And um, because he knew one of the comedians that was performing. And so he took him. And she said, you know, I'm Jewish, right? After they went, after they left. And he went, yeah. And he's like, I was confused by that comment because most Jews prefer to do the Christian Christmas stuff because it's more fun. And he said it. He says, because ours was just kind of made up at the last minute to enter to, so that we wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, we wouldn't be left out. Like he's saying, growing up, we all knew that. We all knew we were just doing it because it's not fair. They're having all the fun and we're just sitting over here, so we got to do something. And it was quite funny that he said that, and it's, it's interesting. But he says here to the stranger, if you're going to be in town and you want to be a part of it, then you got to take part of the whole thing. You got to follow all the rules. You got to take part in it. And it's beautiful because God's desire from the very beginning is that the Jews would be a light to all nations, that they would bring the Gentiles in, and that they would come to know the living God. And so these people were coming in, these Gentiles that were part of the camp, and coming to know the living God. Now you might say, wait a second, there's Gentiles in the camp? There were Gentiles camping with the Israelites who came with them out of Egypt. They were the mixed multitude. We're going to look at that further. It was good in some ways because some of them became part of the family, and some of them became a problem because they didn't want to follow all the rules. They didn't want to follow after the Lord. They wanted the protection of the camp without the Lord in their life. And that doesn't work. That doesn't work. As the Lord here says, hey, you know what? The stranger, they can come in as well. Verse 15, it says, Now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, from evening until morning. It was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So as always, the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that the children of Israel would journey, and in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. At the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. As the children of Israel left Egypt, this cloud by day and this pillar by night began to lead them on their journey. Began to lead them. And when the tabernacle was set up, it came and it rested upon the tabernacle tent. And when the cloud moved, the people moved. When the cloud stayed, the people stayed. The key word here in this section is, at the command of the Lord, they would journey. Or at the command of the Lord, they would stay. That's very important for us because we need to live our life at the command of the Lord. Do we journey or do we stay? Lord, what do you have for me? 
Verse 19, it says, Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. So they didn't go to the elders and say, yeah, you know what, we've been here for three months. I think this, this place is, I don't like the view. Can we move on? Let's have a discussion. Let's have a debate or whatever. Hey, I got this new travel magazine. There's a nice place around the corner. Let's go there. No, they waited for the command of the Lord. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped, and according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only for, from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey, whether by day or night. So you can imagine that. Okay, this massive camp, and we've already talked about how they would come into line and they would all, each family group would move at a certain time and get into this line and follow. This massive camp moves, sets up camp, and the next day, the cloud rises up and begins to move again. And you're like, someone find the kids. <laughs> we got to go again. It's like, ah, we got to go. It's like, you get everything packed up. So I'm sure they traveled light. Because, yeah, that would be crazy. So it was when the cloud remained, verse 21, only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they would journey, whether by day or night. Whether the cloud was taken up, they would journey. And whether it was two days, a month, a year, that the cloud would remain above the tabernacle. The children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. So it could be there for a day. It could be there for a week, a month, a year. They didn't know. They would just trust the Lord. And at the command of the Lord, they remained encamped and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed and kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. The children of Israel moved or stayed based upon the command of the Lord. Whether it was a day or two days or a month or a year, whatever it was, they moved or stayed depending on the command of the Lord. So often in our lives, we are marching into the wilderness on our own command, on our own ideas. And while the Lord is still sitting there saying, where, where are you guys going? Uh, can you slow down? That's not where we're going. You're going the wrong way. Like, what are you doing? And as we've learned, our Lord is very patient with us. I always think of the scene in Willy Wonka, I think it's Charlie and Chocolate Factory or whatever, or Willy Wonka and Chocolate Factory with Gene Wilder. And the kid is doing something he's not supposed to, and he goes, no, stop, don't. And he falls in or something goes, oh. And he goes, help, please, murder. Like, what am I supposed to do? The kid's not listening. And sometimes that's how we are in our life. It's just like, God's standing there going, wait, no. Oh, I'll just, I'll wait until they figure it out. Because they're going to eventually go, wait a second, this isn't right. Where? To, oh, God, you're over there. Okay. Yeah. You, I got this. I'm good. And I think for some of us, if we drew a map of our life, it would be like a little kid's scribbles on a page, right, when they just draw a line. It would be like, went over here, went over there. You know, we make fun of the nation of Israel for wandering the desert for 40 years because they look at the area that they wandered in and they just kind of wandered all over the place. Well, really, it is a picture of our life where we're just like, God, well, where, where, where am I supposed to go now? I'm not sure. Sometimes we're wandering ahead of God, and sometimes... We're sitting there dragging our feet as the Lord is trying to move ahead in our life. And we're just like, well, it's so comfy. It's too early in the morning. I don't want to get up. And you might be thinking sometimes, oh, God, I've been sitting here for six months. When are we going to move? This is crazy. The whole time not realizing that God is far ahead of us preparing the way for us. Preparing, getting things ready for us. He's got a plan. How many of you have ever experienced that where you've got a situation in your life and you've, you've got this stress and this concern about the journey and when you start moving, you see how God moved the pieces into place that in your mind could have never been there, but they were moved into place beforehand. That that person says to you, oh, we decided this three months ago. 
And you go, three months ago, I was sitting in my room going, God, why are you taking so long? God, I don't know why. It's taking forever. God, come on. And he's just like, just let me finish the work. I'm preparing this person or I'm preparing that person. And I'm going to bring it all together at the right time. Stop running around in circles. Just slow down. And I guess sometimes we're just comfy. And God is trying to move ahead. And we're dragging our feet in the dust. And we're watching as God slowly is moving ahead of us. Again, when we are walking in His will, we will be watching. The nation of Israel had to constantly be watching for that cloud, whether it was going to move or not. And we talked about that. When they got up from their tent, what was the first thing they saw? The tabernacle and that cloud. When they went to bed at night, what was the last thing they saw? The tabernacle and the fire. So they were always watching. No doubt there was people in the camp that their job was just kind of always be like, okay, it's not moving yet. Got to check it. Oh, it's moving. I think it's rising up. Got to be good. They're, they were ready and watching and making sure that they were prepared. When we're walking in the will of the Lord, we need to be watching. We need to be alert. We need to be awake. Not stumbling. Not slumbering in our tents. Not sleeping. We need to be ready for when the cloud rises up and moves. There is so much in the scripture about being awake, about being alert, about watching. And in our life, it's important that we be watching. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will, what I will answer when I'm corrected. We are to be watching in prayer for what the Lord has and what He's going to do and say to us. Watching and waiting is part of the Christian life. That we're paying attention, that we're alert. Moses had a question, and what did he do? He stopped, he stood still, and he waited upon the Lord. He went and sought the Lord and waited for the answer. Now, waiting is not sitting around in your living room in your sweatpants eating burritos. Thinking, God, when are you going to get me that job? Waiting upon the Lord, that word waiting is speaking of a waiter. It's the description of someone who is waiting. And what does a waiter do if you're at a good restaurant? <laughs> Brings a coffee. And they're always filling it up. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it or experienced it, but in the fancy places, they'll actually have waiters that stand around the corners of the room, and they just stand there and wait. And as soon as you need someone, they're there. They'll take your fork when it's dirty, replace a new one. They'll just jump in and do whatever needs to be done. They're always checking. They slip that plate out as soon as you're done. I went to one dinner like that, and I was just freaked out because I was just like, what? I wasn't, am I done with that? I guess so. You know, that's, that's not the dinner where you... Flick the plate and then hand it to him. Here you go. It's clean. You can put it back. But that's the way we are. We, when we're waiting upon the Lord, it means that we need to be awake and alert and serving and looking for opportunities for the Lord to move because oftentimes when we are busy doing stuff for the Lord, He is pushing us in the direction that we need to be. And all of a sudden we find ourselves talking to that right person. And we go, wow, that's amazing. They say, you know what? I was looking for someone for this job. That's amazing. Oh, I remember years ago, I was uh, about to get married. It was a scary time. And I was trying to find a new job to make more money because you have to, to supply for your wife so she can have all the stuff she wants. And, uh, and <laughs> all the, you know, the elaborate <laughs> gold plated, you know, but, uh, so I was looking for work, and I had applied to a bunch of places, and I just kept getting turned down. And I was like, come on, this is frustrating. This was on the coast, and so there's a lot more places to, to apply to. And I was kind of frustrated, and I was at work, and that time I was still working at that church on the coast. And I was at work, and one of the elders comes up to me and says, Steve, what are you doing this week? I said, oh, you know, I'm, I've got a couple shifts or whatever. And he says, well, why don't you come with me on Tuesday? We'll go spend the day together. I, could, I need some help. 
And I was like, sure. So I went and worked with him that day and helped him out because he needed an extra hand. He said, I'll pay you whatever to come help me for the day. I was like, sure, no problem. So I did it for one day, did it for two days. On the third day, he says, you know what? This is the deal. I'm giving you my business. And I was like, what? He says, I, I've had this other opportunity, and I wanted to try you out. But I didn't want to tell you that I was trying you out, so I just thought. And he was a guy that I had hung out with before. And then he literally just literally handed me his own business. So I became self-employed and had this business, and I was making like $5,000 a month, which is insane for a 20-year-old. A um, it was crazy, and it was a good job, you know. And the Lord provided that way. It was just like, boom, there you go. And that's sometimes how it happens. If you're busy and you're doing the things you're supposed to do, God will just direct you to that area. But if you're sitting in your basement going, oh, nobody's giving me a job. Have you applied for a job? No. Have you talked to anybody? No. Just waiting for that phone call. Well, yeah. We need to be alert and awake and watching. Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore and do not, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Jesus told us to be watching because we don't know when he's coming. He is coming for us. The trumpet is going to sound and we're going to be with him in glory. It's beautiful. And so therefore, that should make us watchful and alert in our life at every step. Because we know that any moment we can be with him. And so it should change our priority. It should change our passions. It should change how we live. As we're watching him and saying, Lord, show me. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He gave us a promise. He's coming, and so we need to be watching. We need to be ready. We need to be alert. Saying, Lord, I want to be in your will. I want to follow you. Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. When we start laxing on our watching and praying, we fall back on the flesh, and the flesh is weak. And that's when we make mistakes. That's when we make a mess. When we start depending on our flesh to guide us and walk through this life. We are to be watching for the moving and command of the Lord. And we, we must be praying for strength as well. Because we need strength for each day. Because there's temptations all around us. And our flesh is weak. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. Each time that cloud rose off the tabernacle, they had to pack up their stuff and be ready to move into the unknown. They didn't know where they were going. They were like, okay, we're just following you, Lord. And the cloud would rise and they would pack up and they were entering into unknown territory. And when we enter into unknown territory, we need to what? Stand fast in the faith. I know that I don't have a clue where I'm going. I have no clue where you're taking me, Lord. But I know you promised you'd take care of me. I know you promised you're coming for me. So I'm going to stand fast in the faith. I'm going to be brave. And I'm going to be strong knowing that you've got me. And during this time of COVID, that is so important. That we know that the Lord has us and that he's taking care of us. And that he is guiding us. And to stand strong, there's so much. Like I've told you guys over again, turn the TV off. Turn the internet off. There's just too much junk going on out there. Too many um, uh, conspiracy theories. I've heard so many of them, I, it makes me want to puke. You know, on Saturday at the farmer's market, I heard, I don't know, so many people would throw these little comments and you're just like, I can't keep up. I don't know if it's Trump or if it's Trudeau. The Chinese made it in a lab. No, somebody else paid them to do it. No, I don't know. There's, or maybe it's actually just a virus that came from bats. I don't know. And then, then I'm told that the plague has broken out in China. Oh, no, what are we going to do? 
Newsflash, people. The, pl the plague breaks out in China all the time. They tell you that. It's a regular thing. Here's the newsflash, people. Don't be scared. The plague is here in Canada. Squirrels carry the plague. Especially in California. And through the coast. Certain breeds of squirrel carry different types of the plague. And yes, if you get bitten by a squirrel and he sucks on your hand for a while, you could get it. And you will get sick and the doctors will treat you and you will be fine. There's a reason why we haven't had the black plague in a long time. Because we wash our hands. It's like, oh. and we don't throw sewage in the street and let rats run around in our house. You know, there's, uh, but I read these things and I'm like, Stop dealing out fear. And that's why we need to watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. Say, you know what? I don't care what Facebook's saying. I don't care what the internet's saying. I don't care what the news people are saying. I know the Lord's got me. He told me what to prepare for, that he's coming, and I'm to live each day like that. So, hey, here we go. I, when you command me to move, I'm going to move, even when it looks scary. Even when I have no idea What's around the corner? First Thessalonians 5, verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. We need to watch and be sober. We need to be alert and awake, not lulled to sleep. Revelations 3, verse 3, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. We need to be those who are watching and who are awake and ready. The children of Israel had to watch or they would get left behind. Now, I think it would be hard to get left behind, but you never know. 2.5 people start moving. Do you know where uh, Bert and them went? Because they were camped right next to us and they're gone. So is everybody else. I guess we should move. Can you imagine this one tent sitting there in the wilderness? <laughs> You get up, you're like, I slept in this one. Whoa! <laughs> Where did everybody go? It's like, come on. You didn't hear me knocking at the tent? <laughs> I can't hear it. You had to be watching and alert, paying attention to what's going on around you. And in our walk and in our, in our faith, we need to be watching and alert. Because the Lord has commands for us. And we want to be walking in his will. And so we need to say, Lord, I want to know your will, so I want to stand fast, and I want to seek your will. And when you say move, I want to move, and when you say stay, I want to stay. I think that's the hardest part. We love moving. We don't like staying. Staying is when we get a little antsy and stuff. But sometimes he gives us times in our life where we just to stay. This is where you are. This is what you're going to do. Stay here. And I'm completely happy with you staying here because I want you to stay here. I could see some of them after a year going, this is crazy. We've been sitting here for a year. When are we going to move on? We've got to go. And one of them say, hey, don't you remember God said we've got 40 years? Oh, yeah, I guess so. It doesn't really make a difference. <laughs> We're going to be wandering. It's like, you're not going to live anyway. So, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that that way. What a promise, eh? Let us be those who are watching and waiting and standing fast when the Lord commands. We pack up our stuff and we begin to move. And when the Lord commands us to stand still, we stand still. That we step out in faith, trusting and knowing that our mighty God is guiding us and his hand is upon us. And he desires the best for you and he wants to work in your life. It may be tough, but he's going to get you through because he said he would. He never said it was going to be easy. These guys were living in the desert. But he said, I'm going to get you through. I'm going to bring you through. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your truth, Lord God. Lord, may we, may we, may we have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. That we would hear your voice. And we would know your will for us, Lord God. Lord, be moving and guiding. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take me back to
to the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse